architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are yet once again listening to Architecture Talk. It's January 2022 and I'm excited today to be bringing to you the first part of a two-part conversation that I have had with the well-known architectural historian and theorist William J.R. Curtis. Uh, most of you probably know William J.R. Curtis from his books, in particular Modern Architecture Since 1900, Le Corbusier Ideas and Form, uh, and his book on Bividoshi, and along with the, with the innumerable articles that uh, William Curtis writes uh, all the time. But what I'm talking to with him today in these two conversations is his take and reading on the narrative of Indian modernism. Uh, in the first conversation today, uh, we are going to be talking about Indian modernism, but specifically in the context of the life and work of my father, Aditya Prakash. Uh, next time, uh, I will release a conversation with him on his uh, thinking about uh, the Pritzker Prize-winning Indian architect B.V. Doshi. Uh, but for today's conversation, uh, while some of uh, William's uh, ideas on the uh, nature and production of modernism may be familiar to some of you, what might not be so familiar is his personal engagement with Indian modernism uh, and the time that he has spent in India, in the South Asian subcontinent. Uh, through that conversation, you will also see that he had a personal connection with my father. And indeed, William and I um, met for the first time in 1980 when he came to our house uh, looking for material uh, on, on Chandigarh. In this podcast, or perhaps it's in the next, I became an architectural historian in many ways because of William Curtis, and that is a debt that I will never be able to repay. So this conversation has a personal flavor, and I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. So Vikram, this is an extremely touching situation. We have known one another for around 40 years. I'm not sure if I met you the first time in 1980, but we certainly met in 1983. For sure. Uh, and I remember you very well as a, a youth uh, standing a little bit back while your father and myself and your mother, particularly your father and I, discussed architectural issues. Yeah, yeah. All sorts of issues. And then you would sort of disappear and come back. <laughs> and then you sent me this absolutely delightful uh, letter, which I have here. <laughs> here it is. <laughs> Foundation of the Students' Discussion Circle, Chandigarh College of Art. Dear Professor Curtis, it seems like yesterday, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we really would like to get together with you and so on and so on. So <laughs> we did. And it was absolutely memorable because we used to meet right in the middle of the capital on the m m memorial, the, the, you know, the Martyrs. Story, yeah, Martyrs yeah. Memorial, yeah. Uh, with a, a sort of op open air forum with these masterpieces on at each side, yeah. uh, sometimes with the sun going down and the moon coming up. Uh, it gave the classroom a sort of cosmic dimension, which has <laughs> never been equaled in my experience. Uh, <laughs> but it, it rests in my mind with great affection. And uh, what, what are your memories of this, uh, uh, these meetings? Well, I, what I remember is uh, you, my dad bringing you home one day and introducing you as an architectural historian and writer. And I was just absolutely fascinated by what you were doing. And, uh, and that's the first time I thought, wow, this would be such an exciting thing to be doing as a profession, <laughs> to be just writing about architecture and thinking about it. So I got to figure out how to, how to think about this. And so we found this group of friends. I persuaded them that we have to make this discussion circle. And we had to have our patron, uh, patron saint, William Curtis. 
<laughs> well, I, I was happy to for, fulfill the, the role because I could sense this great um, enthusiasm and, and thirst for, for, for knowledge and questioning and so forth. Perhaps at this point, I should mention that my first contact with Shandigar was three years earlier. And this gets oh. us immediately to Aditya. Uh, yeah. Because, in fact, you know, one of the things I've so enjoyed about reading your book is bringing back memories of things he discussed with me very, very early on. Um, you see, I came to India in April, May of 1980, mm. on my way back from Australia, uh, giving mm -hmm. lectures there. And in fact, rigged it in such a way that I could stop in India. I was fascinated by India. Arrived in Delhi in the hot season, uh, got installed in a little Asian guest house off Connaught Circus. Very early in the morning, located a, a rickshaw driver who became my faithful guide for, for the next three days. And within an hour, was looking at the tomb of Humayun. And oh, was, fabulous. And yeah. was completely carried away. Of course, I'd studied a lot of these things in books, but to see that in early morning light. And so it continued with zigging and zagging across the, the nine delis or the seven or however many you think there are, uh, took like a bad in the extreme heat, uh, the Qutub Minar, the Lodi tombs. I was absolutely um, captivated. I have to say that I had long time been interested in Islamic architecture and, uh, you know, it, it traveled a great deal in the Middle East and India was a, 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 a sort of missing link in my, in my thinking. Mm -hmm. Then I went off to Agra, of course. Um, I accompanied a tourist bus and then escaped from the, from the group, uh, from the Taj and, and went to the tomb of Itmud Dawula and all the rest. Yes. It was extremely hot. And then I wanted to get out to Fatipur Sikri and there was no, no sign of any taxi. But I saw a guy fixing his car in the driveway. And I said, how do you feel about driving me to Fatipur Sikri for, for 100 rupees? He said, fine. So off we went uh, in a, and arrived in a dust storm. I remember seeing the gate of victory rising out of the dust. And I actually, it's a bit like the last years of Marimbad, the strange atmosphere of these haunting perspectives with nobody there um, <laughs> on top of the Panch Mahal with my hat blowing and scuttering across the roof and uh -huh. a pale sun rising up. And in the end, um, I, I spent the night in the Dak bungalow and got up very early, uh, was completely and totally astounded by Fatipur Sikri, of course. Yes, and then back to Delhi, and then the final leg was to take the bus from the you know, north bus station up to Shandigarh. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was sitting next to a, a chap who was in the publishing industry and he said, oh, you know, my dream is to come and live in Shandigarh. I said, why is that? He said, because it's clean and green. I thought, oh, yeah. is, it's, it's a lovely place to bring people up. And, you know, we got there to the, you know, the clamor of the bus station. He said, well, where are you spending the night, uh, Mr. William? I said, I'm got a clue. He said, well, come with me, meet Mr. Bat in the Pankaj Hotel, and we'll set you up. And so I, I had a room in, the, in the, the same hotel. I was sent out with a chit to the English wine and beer to bring back beer. And we, <laughs> we sat on the floor of his room. And meanwhile, I telephoned the one person who I had a, a, a formal name for, a certain Aditya Prakash, principal <laughs> of the School of Architecture. This was a letter of introduction from Peter Johnson, who was the head of the school in, in uh, New South Wales, in, in Sydney. And obviously they'd met through the Commonwealth Link. Yeah. A delightful letter of introduction saying, Aditya, I'd like you to meet, blah, 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 blah. anything you can do. You know, he's a fascinating yeah. person, blah, blah, blah. And apparently he even included a CV, which was rather formal. <laughs> so your father answered, said, oh, yes, I got Johnson's letter. So why don't you come and have a cup of tea tomorrow at nine at the school? Yeah. So, of course, I got up at seven, you know, I was so excited. And I was set out in a rickshaw along Central V where there yeah. was nobody. There was actually very little traffic in those days. And there, looming out of the greenery were the funnels of the and the pyramid of the uh, of the Parliament building, and I was completely blown away by the power of this uh, form. So we met and we immediately uh, hit it off. It was uh, really uh, tremendous. Uh, and um, we chatted about this and I said, look, let's, let's just get you sorted out with a chit. I've got a letter here, a formal letter to the head of the assembly of such and such. Uh, please permit William Curtis to visit all parts of the capital, including uh, the two chambers. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, so off you go and come to uh, sector, to the official bungalow of the director but, uh, this evening at, uh, you know, whenever you like, 
So I went, I set off and actually managed to go all over all the buildings, top, bottom, inside out, to photograph them. And it was, you know, again, I mean, within what, three days of Fatipur Sikri, uh, I, I did sense the links, by the way. Yeah. Um, you know, and then at the end of the day, I went out to the yacht club and dunked my head in the in the water and drank about three bottles of water. Came across town to your your parents' place with the parched lawn, and we sat outside and had whiskies and sodas, and we got again on so well. And in fact, your father started talking about his time in Britain. You know, yeah. some of the things that you <laughs> recount very very well in in, in your book. Uh, and then at a certain point, he said. My God, you know, uh, Curtis, you're so much more fun than I thought you'd be from that letter. <laughs> I, I told I told my wife, oh God, there's some one of these sort of American academics he teaches at Harvard. This is going to be hard work. And actually, <laughs> we have to admit something to you. I said, well, what's that? He said, well, there was a lizard that got stuck in the air conditioner. We used your CV to scrape it off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, it, it, this, this established the terms of a wonderful friendship that continued in correspondence, in sending me books and texts. I got all of his main uh, publications. So this was this was 1980, right? <laughs> so our meeting, which was three years later, between the two, uh, you know, I'd gone back. I was still teaching two more years at, uh, at Harvard. But, of course, the, the question was, translating some of these powerful impressions into lectures and texts. I'd already thought a great deal about Corbusier. I'm sure you know, I was uh, yeah. uh, teaching in the Carpenter Center. I'd written a book about it. Uh, you know, I was uh, uh, deeply involved with, right. with, right. with Corbusier. So, um, you know, it was uh, formulating sort of what on earth the whole thing was about. And in 1981, I did this exhibition in the Carpenter Center called Fragments of Invention on the sketchbooks of Corbusier which included the Indian sketchbooks. And of course, the whole theme of transformation into uh, the forms of his, his architecture. Metamorphosis is one of the obsessions uh, I had. Right. So, you know, th this is the way things tend to work with me. Very strong direct uh, impressions, text, Bayman text, back to the thing, back and forth, back and forth. So that's just to sketch it all in for, for the listeners. Fantastic, fantastic, yes. I, I remember exactly all these things, these stories about the lizards and the seaweed. But you did get to know him uh, quite well then, my father. Uh, how does that memory compare with the book? Well, you see, um, I, you know, I, I knew a slice, you could say. I mean, oh, I knew certain facets of your, your father. And um, the, the things that came, came across were... Uh, his values. I mean, to say um, a lot of the things you do talk about, but his his uh, humanism, if you should wish to call it that, his animalism. <laughs> right, right. Animalism, for sure. Yeah. That was that was there very early on uh, in yeah. the conversation. And yeah. I was intrigued coming from a place like the USA, the extent to which he was, let's say, involved in, in, in understanding rural, rural wisdom uh, mm -hmm. as, as a part of the equation. Uh, I'd certainly been thinking about these sort of things in relation to North Africa and other things that I, I, I had done. Um, his wit, his sense of um, self-mockery, uh, you know, gentle. Uh, <laughs> but when he told me the stories about pumping shillings into gas meters in freezing cold uh, Edinburgh, wherever he was, yeah. um, I mean, you know, the, the, these these were the stories that, that, that settled. Um, he, he did not talk about... The Franconia. One of the things I love in your book is the, <laughs> is the, the voyage of discovery. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. It's very well done. The early part of the book is, uh, you know, I really, uh, you know, enjoy this very much. And then, of course, having to deal with British society. You know, having mm -hmm. to deal with dinner jackets or goodness knows what. Having to deal yeah. with the, the oddities and formalities of, of, of British society. But the the other thing that um, struck me very strongly again. You see, I was, you know, let's say on the edge of Harvard. I did not, uh, was not teaching full time in the graduate school of design. On the contrary, I used my position in Carpenter Center as a kind of commando post, you know, because there was <laughs> there was so much nonsense going on uh, there, you know, in in the form of a, a, a nascent postmodernism, simple-minded uh, typology, you know, all the things that were yeah, banging. Yeah. In schools and you know so so and of course a very deep skepticism about any concept of planning in, right. in, any, in any real sense this was right. the 
regression into the idea that there is no such thing as an intelligent plan. Collage city, uh, you know, you, you sort of bounce off the existing you know, contextuals mm-hmm. and this and that. So to come to the great, the great Chandigarh and to meet someone who was absolutely clear about the importance of a grand plan for society, uh, of integrating the modern and, and, and nature, um, he was not an unquestioning Corbusier on the urbanistic plan. No, no. Not at all, as, as, as we know. But this was extremely interesting to me to, to you know, contrast the kind of things I've been surrounded in constantly in, in, in the Harvard environment with what I was seeing in front of myself, you know, with my own eyes and, and with the writings, which were, were full of faith, let's say, mm-hmm. In, mm-hmm. in what a place like Shandigarh could do for humanity. And I thought right. this was... I thought this was wonderful, you know, the, and they were like kind of really odd objects in that kind of cynical, uh, you know, uh, world uh, that, that, that I was surrounded by. Right, right. No, I, I, I like your use of the word faith. I mean, he continued to have faith in this sense, in, in the modernist ethos and the modernist plan, even as he was very critical of a lot of aspects of it. And, and, and there was question discussion about how to move the discussion uh, discourse ahead, but was very unhappy about the turn to the postmodernism, not only at the GSD, but in many aspects of uh, Indian architecture as well, right? Did you encounter some of that? I know you got very now, in, you know, beyond Chandigarh, you got quite involved in Indian modernism at many different registers. Did you? I, got in, I got involved in Indian modernism, but I got in, involved in, in Indian traditions. Let yes. me explain that uh, the... The second trip when yeah. I, I came with Catherine, we were actually uh, we sort of cut all the strings with uh, with the West <laughs> uh, and just pushed off, and we'd set up a base in Bangkok, uh-huh. uh, and from there we explored um, Southeast Asia. Yeah. Um, I just had a deep feeling, um, starting in the late seventies, that. Uh, you know, I could give a marvelous lecture about the Pantheon or about Palladio, about this or that, but that I was deeply ignorant of the great moments of Asian architecture uh, mm-hmm. and of their systems of meaning, and that, you know, there was a lot of inspiration to be had. So, actually, after that, you know, the great revelation at Fatipur Sikri with the sun rising out of the, of the dust, and after Shandiga, I said to my about to be wife, I said, look, how do you feel about really just pushing off? And she said, wonderful. She had been, you know, she's from a diplomat's family. She'd been brought up partly in Southeast Asia. So actually in 83, before we turned up uh, the second time in Shandigar, we had been on the road for about two months in pretty rigorous conditions, uh, plunging into the depths of Indian traditional architecture. I mean, places like Aihole, Patadakal, uh, the beginnings of the Hindu temple. I was trying to understand the archetypes, uh, Buddhist archetypes, because in Thailand you have much later rendition of these, these forms. And so we went to, you know, the great sites. We, we lost ourselves in provincial towns, uh, day-to-day life. We, we were wandering. We stumbled into Ahmedabad, you know, about three quarters of the way through this thing. Yeah. So Ahmedabad was a colossal impact, um, of course, for the modern as well, with to see Corbusier's four buildings there. Right. And then we came finally again to, uh, to finish up to, to Shandigar. So when I came to, to Shandigar uh, and met, met your group, you know, there was a, quite a lot of, let's say, uh, ancient India under the, under the belt, including in sketchbooks, photos, and so forth. It was a deep immersion, I would say. And I always felt about Corbusier, and there's nothing so original about saying this, that he was a, a great modernist, but of course he had a profound sense of, of the past. Right. And I published a piece in um, Prospecta 20, the Yale Journal, which used to be a really excellent journal, I don't know how it is now, which was called Authenticity, Abstraction and the Ancient Sense, Le Corbusier's and Louis Kahn's Ideas of Parliament. Mm-hmm. And you can pick up the edge there because this was an attack on postmodernism. It was saying yeah, yeah. The, the profound modernists, you know, yeah, or, yeah. Uh, uh, have a much deeper sense of the past than the people throwing around keystones or, or whatever. Yeah. So th- there was a line of thinking there. And in my last uh, year or so at Harvard, they had a, a really actually extremely good conference called Monument and City where I did a whole thing about, you know, the great modern monumental builders, whether it was the 
uh, Sydney Opera House or, of course, Khan. I was getting profoundly interested in Khan, although I hadn't yet been to see Bangladesh. I'd been in Ahmedabad, uh, which was strong enough. But I realized there again that, you know, that, that, that this was an architect with a radar that picked up very deep messages from the past and trans uh, metabolized them into, into his, uh, his architecture. So the, the, the Indian experiences were in a curious way involved with both the modern and the ancient. And when coming, you know, now to the Festival of India, you see, so here I was in and out of these things. And out of the blue, I received a telegram in Bangkok from the Aga Khan Award for Architecture uh, at the end of 84 saying, could, would you be available in Geneva to come as a special guest of the steering committee to discuss whatever? I thought, well, okay. I mean, I knew about their activities. I was always a little bit cautious about some of their activities, the Islamic identity, etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we went and it was, uh, you know, of course, uh, staying at the Hotel Richemont, the uh, Mercedes driving you around and all the other accoutrements of the, the Aga Khan. And um, among the people on the committee were people I knew very well, like Oleg Grabar, Bill Porter from, uh, but I met for the first time, Charles Correa. Mm -hmm. Charles and I hit it off. We were sitting at breakfast one day and we started talking about India. I said, oh yes, well, you know, at uh, Tanjore, the such and such, and oh yes, you know, at, you know, I just came out with a string of these, uh, these things in Sri Lanka and this and I said, my God, you've been around. I said, well, look, this is a passion for me, Charles. I mean, I'm, you know, deeply, deeply interested in the architectures of the, sub, the subcontinent. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, he said, this is perfect. I said, what do you mean it's perfect? He said, I'm going to contact the uh, Festival of India immediately in India, have you fl uh, flown out uh, to join up a committee with um, Papal Jaika and, and company. And uh, I would like you to be involved in the selection of modern works in this thing, mm -hmm. although you obviously have a very deep feeling for, for the past. So, you know, we, we, we were off in Mexico, actually. I was giving a stack of lectures there and then Telegram, go and pick up your first class tickets and your visa. So instead of being on bull carts or, and staying in dak bungalows, suddenly we were in six star hotels with drivers and all the rest of it. You know, it's really funny. <laughs> and, um, and so the great day came of Safdar Jang Road to yeah, meet yeah. Jaika, who was, as you know, Mrs. G's, uh, Mrs. Gandhi's sort of right hand person in so many right. things. Right. Kapilya Vatsayayan, who was the yeah. kind of philosopher, yeah. um, and, and other notables, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I was sort of drawn into this sort of Delhi, um, you know, high, 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 high flowing uh, uh, society, mm -hmm. and indeed began to uh, prospect for interesting modern work. I mean, using the driver, things that well known things, of course, Raj Rawal and so on and so on. But others, you know, and the same in Chandigarh and the same in, in, in the surrounding Ahmedabad. This was the beginning of a thing that never fully worked out, as, as I'll come to in a moment. Now, Charles, as you know, it was actually called Dashan at the beginning. It was not called Vistara, this thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and, and he was obsessed with the mandala, or at least with nine squares. Right. And we had very intense discussions. And I said, well, wait a minute, Charles. I mean, a mandala is not just a shape. Yeah, yeah. Point one. Two, yeah. I think there's an ideological risk in this. He said, what do you mean an ideological risk? I said, there's an ideological risk imposing the idea that anything of real interest in India stems automatically from uh, that tradition. I said, that's, you, you, that can be easily turned on its head. And, be, and in fact, there's a school of historians, Nat, who used to say under every tomb, there's a, basically a temple of, uh, form. Mm -hmm. Well, we know where this all went eventually. Don't yes, we? that's right. We do. We do. Yeah. Well, I, blew, I blew the whistle on that before it happened. I said, I'm just not comfortable with this, you know, yeah. th this idea of tracing everything back to. Anyway, we had a sort of bit of a you know, thing about this. Anyway, all this to say, well, then in parallel, I had met Raj Rewal, who was organizing the French Festival of India. Right which was uh, much, um, much more neutral in its way of treating the past with excellent redone drawings, improving on the government of India drawings and so on. And with three sections, the past, Corbusier and company, and then the contemporary. And I wrote a piece on uh, actually called The Ancient in the Modern about the capital. Mm -hmm. So indeed, there, there were all these uh, confluences. But, uh, I, and then a lot of other texts followed fairly quickly. I mean, I think you know that towards an authentic regionalism is, is one of them. And 
That was delivered in Bangladesh, um, you know, in a, a, great, a great event in 85. And once again, you know, in that audience, I said, well, do you see Khan's building as a thing off another planet that's just been plonked here from quote unquote the West? Or do you see it as something which actually has the capacity to generate interconnections with, with, with lost pasts? Because I see it as that. I see it related to a centralized tradition. I see it as an incredible transformation of tomb forms, uh, a, a deep, deep understanding of these. Uh, anyway, led to these kind of uh, debates. So I, in, in, in the, the piece uh, which I read out there, I actually wanted to say, that's why I'm sort of cautious about heaving around the word postmodern, because I think that the, the, the depth of understanding of tradition of a, a, a Rewal or a Doshi or whatever, uh, is, is, is not to be confused with the kind of lightweight stuff that was going on in, in, in Europe. Uh, you know, they, they were interested in tradition in the early, in the late 50s and, 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 and reading it. But of course, that was a position very different from your father's, which you bring out very clearly in the book. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, what do you think was the impact of the festivals on, uh, on the discourse of Indian architecture at that time? Did it, did it move it in the right direction? Uh, how do you think it helped or, or, or how did it play out? How did the, just from your impression, how did the festivals play out in their mission? In which place? In, in Either in, one, the US or the Paris one, and you can differentiate all the Russian uh, one even. Well, it's hard for me to say what-, what uh, uh, Just the architectural part, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that, um, you know, in, in, in France, um, which is after all a fairly sophisticated audience, there was a, a full understanding of what was being said, that uh, what I wrote about Corbusier was very well received there, I remember this, and there was mm -hmm. Rie Boulet who did a beautiful thing about the composition of the, the capital, the geometry and so on. Jean-Louis Verret was the commissioner of that, you know, who yeah. worked just with Corbusier and Ahmedabad. For the traditional architecture, it was just, uh, you know, a, a very fine presentation of uh, buildings that interested French people. I don't think they kind of took it in, in any ideological sense at all. Um, and then there was curiosity about the contemporary architectural uh, uh, culture, including Tagore Theatre, by the way, which was uh, included in both festivals. Right, right. Both. which, well, you know, has been kind of destroyed now. You know, the... Yes. yes. Yeah, yes. okay. Yeah, yes. go on. So of course I, I I do know that. Yeah. Now whether you see, I think it's it's like all over simple messages, they have to be issued with a government smoking warning. Mm -hmm. And this issue of the past with a big P mm -hmm. was all was at real risk of running amok in, in India, I think. Um that um you see, Adoshi or um, Korea or whatever, they were deeply grounded in, in you know, modern architectural planning principles and abstraction and so forth and so on. So when they were um, interacting with the past, it was with strong filters that were, in fact, extending the modern tradition in, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, just as true of, of uh, you know, Giancarlo de Carlo or any number of other people. And of course, they were very aware of Team 10. They were very aware of those... Um, re-readings of the urban fabric and so forth that the Smithsons were involved in, which helped them to look at the urban tissue in a certain way in India. Okay. So there, there was a kind of strength. The more, the, the more that architects loosen them, their relationship, the tension with, with Corbusier was very, very important. I mean, for example, one of my favorite buildings by, by Correa is the Bharat Bhavan. Uh, in, uh, Bhopal. In Bhopal, the marvelous yeah, building. Yeah, fabulous building, fabulous, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, now, look, you know, this is a beautifully sited series of platforms and courts. It's an yeah. incredibly clever transformation of the platforms of the Sydney Opera House, right. uh, uh, combined with, of course, a Corbusier capping and so on and so on. But, you know, with great uh, wit and skill and, and elegance, it produces this, this, this kind of a building that resonates with the mosques across the lake and on and on. You can go on forever about, about, that, uh, about that building. So I think that as long as there was this sort of tension with the quote-unquote modern masters, the past was something enriching. If you cut, if you cut the strings, you were left with, with pastiche. 
you, you were left without, you know, with just sort of reiterations of images of the of the past. That was that was the danger in the whole thing. But I wouldn't overrate the importance of the the festivals of India. Actually, did you and you have been to Jaipur and did you see the Jawahar Kala Kendra and the other later Korea buildings? Even the British Council in uh, Delhi. Well, yes, you could say that in Charles's own production. He became too literal. I mean, uh, he, he used in these Aga Khan uh, meetings, which we, you know, I was uh, quite frequently invited for these things around the place. Uh, he used to make the distinction between transfer and transformation. Mm-hmm. And he said transfer is just taking the outer shapes of uh, meaning, if you like, without the meaning and applying them. Whereas transformation is digging in, understanding what's going on and injecting a new level of of, of meaning. Mm-hmm. And uh, he tried to double code, if you want to use that word, um, in the, the other Bhopal building, the State Assembly. Yeah, um, right, right. With the round plan. And, yeah. and the, there, I just think he goes too far. You know, I think mm. the, 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 you know, the quotations are too, uh, are too, too obvious, uh, yeah. if, if you like. Yeah? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There isn't enough transformation. But why, why do you think that happened? I mean, Charles Correa, unbelievably bright man. I mean, sophisticated, articulate thinker and, and doing such an amazing body of work, starting from the late 70s onward. Suddenly, just from then, somewhere there onwards became much more, uh, whatever the word is, literal in his transformations. Well, I don't know if it's the pressure of international fashion. I mean, um, uh, you know, the, I have to say in parallel with these, uh, my involvements with the, with, with India, I was uh, highly critical of some of the choices of the Aga Khan Award. I mean, uh, in 1985, they, they selected, or 86 rather, the Bong Mosque in Pakistan, which was this complete... Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. They, and the yeah. Robert region. Wendry was the chair. Yes, of course. Yeah. You see, it was Abdel Wakil. Uh, yeah. It was in instant history for the Gulf. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it was marketing, you know, Abdel Wakil uh, posed as the spiritual son of Fatih, but did these Fatih-esque buildings for, for millionaires in Jeddah and so on and so forth. So there was mm. a, a pressure towards uh, an oversimplistic traditionalism, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, in some of those societies. And there was a kind of unholy marriage between postmodernism and that kind of traditionalism, I would say. And uh, I, I know they never acknowledge, for example, the amazing skyscraper in Jeddah by Gordon Bunshaw, which is mm-hmm. the, the oasis in the air. It was, it was just um, unthinkable for them to do that. So, you know, there, there were pressures of all, uh, of, of all kinds. So, so we're really talking about the mid the mid eighties and the kind of flux of uh, architectural opinion around the around the world. And uh, I think that Do- Doshi's best work is still when he's in high tension with the, with Corbusier and Khan. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Sangat is the, you know, the, 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 the even earlier works I, I like very much, you know. Yeah, I mean, Sangat is just brilliant. I mean, I think it's a fantastic building. What do you think? Uh, well, we'll, we'll do Doshi later on. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell, you, you had this whole concept of upper scan. Uh, for for the festivals installation idea uh, for the festival. Oh yes, 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 yes. Oh yes, yes. Well, now this was a whole story which is a little yeah. bit touchy. You have to be careful here. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, uh, Charles was a, a person of the most tremendous gusto. You know, to make things happen. Uh, you know, he kept arranging for me to be flown in and out. We'd meet up in in Bombay and we'll meet here and meet there, and. Um, we were coming to the question of the installation. And I said, look, you know, you've got a theme of meandering, but also of cuts going right through, linking, you know, foreground and background, linking certain, let's say, core ideas and tradition that are transformed. And this begins to suggest a geometry. And I did a sketch, which I called Akbar's Camp, mm. <laughs> <laughs> which was with, you know, t- temporary wooden pieces and then the see-throughs and, and this zigzagging thing. Anyway, what came out was a little bit like Akbar's Camp, but by then I was no longer involved with the whole thing because um, Charles sent me off on a wild goose chase in America to go and talk to the director of the New York Public Library about possibly putting the show there when I was teaching in, in the States. And they didn't have a, a brief on it. I was put in a very strange position. So, you know, things kind of went off in their different direction. And in the end, it never appeared in, in the USA. It went to, you know, an exhibition space in Bombay and was given this new title, Vis- Vistara, and which was very much his agenda. 
of, of the, you know, the nine square plan and, and, and so forth. The best thing in that catalog, from my point of view, is the interview with the wonderful architect in the South. Uh, uh, Laurie Baker. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, wonderful interview. So you see, you know better than I, there were a lot of things brewing in India about tradition and identity and this and that, which, uh, you know, people were uh, responding to in their, in their, in their different manner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what has been your engagement uh, in, uh, with uh, India since the 90s or in the 2000s? Uh, uh, I know you were involved in the Chandigarh conference in, in between and, and so on. So how have, you, what has, how have you sort of engaged, continued this engagement? In 88, after really eight years of a very intense presence in and out, uh, uh, in which I wrote, um, you know, some of the things that you know, uh, the introduction to the Raj Rewell monograph in French, mm -hmm. Architecture Moderne, Racine and Bien, Modern Architecture, Indian uh, Roots, um, lots of articles uh, in, in various uh, uh, formats, and uh, of course, uh, the Architectural Review, Modern Architecture, The Search for Indian Identity, 1987, and in, remember that, you know, these are just articles. What was really going on, one of the reasons I needed to go to Chantigar was that I was writing Le Corbusier Ideas and Forms, and which was written in 85, 86 with two, you know, very substantial chapters on India, one on Chantigar mm -hmm. uh, and the other on, uh, on Ahmedabad. And so, uh, and in, similarly, going back to 1980, the impact of that first visit was very clear in the, um, the text Mod uh, uh, Modern Architecture since 1900. These, these were the hefties. In 87, I did a second edition of Modern Architecture since 1900, which was written on the table at the back of Sangat, by the way, which included uh, a selection of works by Charles, by, by Doshi, of course, the Sangat, um, uh, by Anand Rajir, uh, and so forth and so on. So th this period was one of uh, maximum contact with uh, with very many different things going on in in in, in India. So after eighty eight, uh, you know, I, I didn't go back until ninety nine. Uh, I sort of needed to get away. Anyway. I was being kind of drawn into a step well, you know, of, of Indianness, <laughs> and <laughs> and. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I got involved in other things, got very involved in Spanish architecture, actually, when it came to... Mirais, Mirais, yeah, you were working yes, on yes, yes, yes. I the, the love, I love that. Yeah, amazing uh, work, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the very first uh, collaboration I did with uh, El Croquis was, was yeah. on Mirais and Pinos, yeah. and yeah, yeah. It's one of my favorite essays, too. It's called uh, Mental Maps and Social Landscapes. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. I, did, yeah, I, I know it well, yeah. I did maybe 15 texts over 10 years, you know, yeah. with, uh, it's a lot with, involved in that, with Caesar, with this and that. Yeah. So for a period at least, my life was much more uh, European, a little bit less USA. I was very rarely uh, teaching or doing anything in the USA. We were living in France where we do live. Uh, and India was always, you know, in the, in the back of my mind, and there were communications. And then this invitation came to the 50 years of the idea Congress in 99, which you're, father quite extraordinarily was not made part of uh, which I just find astounding but anyway I'm sure you do too so and I was given center stage there and uh, a keynote and, and not the keynote that was the one with Kenneth Frampton but it was it was wonderful to come back and, and meet people again and, and, uh, and so forth although I always felt you know you know that they're just passing through I, I know I know this place you know I mean I really have a very <laughs> deep, deep emotional yeah. link to yeah. and let us not forget you know we, we need to do some backtracking because uh, uh, in 83 was when I first met P.L. Varma Yes, yes. And, and we became profound friends. Uh, I have wonderful letters. I have one here where he's talking about the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi and what it meant to him and so on. So, OK, so there was this big, big event uh, in, in, uh, in 99. And for me, part of the beauty of that was that Dennis Lasden and his wife could come. And, you know, the architect of all architects to understand monumentality, the National Theatre, who'd studied Chandigarh since he was, you know, since the first drawings appeared, to see his face light up when he w walked up the ramps of the, you know, the high court or, or yeah. you know, so it was, it was fantastic, you know, and then we yeah. traveled around together, went to Ranakpur, went to, you know, Medabad and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, th 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 this was, um, 
a month back in, in, in India. Um, but it was not the same as the kind of engagement that there had been uh, uh, earlier on. And then yeah. we can, can, can kind of track fast forward to uh, 2015 when they had all the celebrations to, you know, to do with the cleanup and the UNESCO, yeah, uh, yeah. et cetera. And there I had the honor of presenting my big second edition of Corbusier to the governor of Punjab and this and that and the other. <laughs> that was a real, uh, back where we used to meet. <laughs> with, with and there was a fancy dinner at the Swiss uh, embassy in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And I was moving around from one place to another. And suddenly this elegant gentleman sat next to me and said, I'm Bajpai. I was the ambassador at Safdar Jang Road when you came and we all met. And I said, oh my <laughs> And then along comes your friend, isn't it, uh, uh, Lal, uh, who, who did the Mikro. book. Yeah. Yes, he said, well, I don't know if you remember me, but I was one of the boys on the ramps. <laughs> oh, he presented me with this huge tome on Buddhist architecture. Uh, you know, so in, India sort of com comes and goes, and as, as does Bangladesh, by the way. You know, it's just a kind of thing that keeps uh, moving in and out. Um, and there was... Uh, uh, so, you know, I always felt that CEPT was like a spiritual home, the school in Ahmedabad, um, especially the kind of T, the T zone at the back, bumping yeah. into people. Um, yeah, yeah. And one of my memories of this, uh, you know, being there in, uh, you know, the, there was this 361 degrees thing, there was the Vaki memorial um, lectures and what have you at CEPT. This is what, 2014, I can't remember. But um, it was when Charles gave his last lecture in, uh, in Ahmedabad. And it was a very impressive uh, event. And that's when I realized the extreme danger into which the modern patrimony of India was falling. Mm. Uh, I, you know, there were members of the administration of the city and so on. I stood up and I said, I've known Ahmedabad for 30 something years. Uh, I've known it when it was a dusty semi rural environment, you know. Uh, and um, of course, it's in a boom of some kind, but there are a lot of things at risk in this model of development. And I, you know, set off on a harangue about what it was doing to the, you know, the city and quality. And I said, not least is your cultural memory. And when I say cultural memory, uh, I, I say, I invite you to get into a taxi and go out to Sarkej and look at the mm -hmm. Uh, of, of these great Muslim monuments. I think it's important to underline that they are Muslim monuments. You know, there was a hierarchy operating, you know, clearly. And, and uh, I said, and not just that, your modern buildings are under threat. Um, and he looked at me as if I, the journalists all let forward, you know, to take notes and all the rest of it. <laughs> and Charles skedaddled off and so on. Anyway, then at a, a dinner in the dark, we were together again and this all came up and, uh, uh, that's when I started to write pieces in the Architectural Review about the importance of redefining the uh, patrimony laws to protect the best of modern architecture. And then you know what happened, you know, a year ago with Khan and all that, and I got right. involved in the forefront of that battle to, to try and save Khan's dormitories, and I don't know where that is now. But there we are. We've brought this a long way up to date. But those are, they are in retrospect engagements with India. It's not the same immediate passion there was between 80 and 88, which was a particular stage in one's life, a particular stage in, in, in India, but a very, uh, very, very uh, deep one. And uh, I mean, the, the impact of, of, uh, uh, of the ancient things has remained with me. And my, I've done photographic exhibitions. Uh, I'm also a painter, by the way, which is one of the things. Oh, that... I didn't know that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, there we go. You see, I, I, and uh, my paintings, which are called mental landscapes, are abstractions of, um, of the world and of nature, but also they come out of my travel sketches of ruins and, 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 and what have you. So, you know, this is something we can get back to when we come back to, uh, to uh, Aditya, because this aspect of his life was, was very, very uh, in, in, important. Where the painting we... was very important for my father, of course. He, yes. he, he, was he painting in his uh, office even when you visited him still? Not that I can remember. Um, yeah. and I actually don't even remember talking to him about that. But uh, it's obvious, you know, from your, from your book, how important that was in the last years of his life and the continuous line. And incidentally, your 
announcement, students discussion circle has a continuous line. We've sketched there a kind of parabola, you know, over uh, 40 years of various things about India, Indian architecture. And supposing we now go back to your, your father and his, uh, his work and, his, um, and eventually your book, because he, um, you know, what, one of the things that uh, um, I like very much about the, uh, the book is it, it's a hugely important documentation of how things were really being done in the team of people in Shandiga, how, how the whole thing was put together, uh, the roles of different people, the relationship with, with uh, Pierre Jeanneret uh, and so forth. And uh, you could say the sort of um, professional expectations uh, that were built in for this generation of Indian uh, architects. I think that the, the other thing is the architectural language because mm -hmm. you, you, you know for well, my, my obsessions with Shandiga are with the monumental um, I keep, you know, you ask about uh, me coming back to India. I forgot to mention the number of times I've written other texts about Chandigarh. The sense of dealing with very great architecture is something that doesn't leave me. I keep coming around to uh, the, the symbolic power of those uh, of those buildings in numerous texts in one form or another, going all the way back through the 90s. I've always um, concentrated more on that than on the, the rest of of the of the place, uh, which uh, is not because I'm not interested in it. It's just you know you do what you do. Right. And I think that one of the things that uh, intrigued me when I first came was the the language of the rest of the fabric. I mean, to say you know the rows of shops, the um, the different uh, categories of housing, and sort of where does that all fit in? And obviously, it's got a lot to do with Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, but not right. just. So this, this question of a, a sort of more normative typology and language is extremely important, you know, to, to understand uh, the fabric of, uh, of Chandigarh. And I remember when I was there in 1999, I was sitting next to Bernard Huet, a French architect, who, who said, I'm much more interested in the schools and the hospitals than I am in Corbusier's great monuments. You know, I'm interested yeah. in relative neutrality. And I think there's almost an unplotted um, hierarchy system uh, of architectural language, which reminds me of Alberti's ideas on the city, that the monuments have, you know, grandiose treatment, and then you work your way down, you know, to pilasters, and then eventually to openings, and so on, so on, so on. And, and this goes through the frame. You talk about the frame. Frame control, yeah. yeah. Those frame controls are on, you know, full stop diapason operatic uh, grandiosity with the Corbusier buildings. Yeah. And then down to you know relative neutrality in the in the other buildings. So your father's uh, architecture was for the most part in that zone. I think that you convey very uh, uh, clearly his priorities as a designer and as, a, as an architect in, in the book. That's great. Were there unexpected things in the book, things that surprised you? Well, I didn't know really about the agricultural colleges. You know, I, I'd never studied those and, and th these were fascinating. So that that was, uh, you know, completely new to me. And of course, a lot of his own photographs, which are absolutely fantastic. He's a very good photographer. His linear cities, I didn't know about either. You see, I think that th there can be a kind of time lag with concepts. I mean, probably a lot of people thought he was just nuts with these ideas at the time. Oh, they did, totally, at that time, yeah. 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 But, but actually, I think a, a linear formulation of urban growth is, is absolutely pertinent to, to India because that's what's happening automatically in laissez-faire development along, along roads, you know. So the, the idea of a sort of more tidied-up version of that is, is, is a, you know, is, is certainly pertinent uh, today. You know, what, what comes through is um, a willingness to reflect on the future, you know, to, to try and have a more balanced... Uh, uh, he says at one point, I don't believe in the distinction between country and city. They, they should be completely inter, interconnected at all points, and they are, in fact, often things of this kind. I, I put a lot of emphasis on the Nehruvian impression on the city and, and, and what I call Nehruvian modernism, the idea that there was a certain ethos, it was, you know, that, that, that in a certain way... Kabuzier and the whole Chandigarh ethos, you know, found a perfect match in the Nehruvian moment. Uh, I thought that, that it's, it's like a two-way kind of a meeting of minds. What do you think about the discussion of the concept of Nehruvian uh, modernism? Um, I, I thought it was a bit too schematic. Uh, mm. I mean, I, I think that it, this, this needs 
to be investigated more for the complexities of the of, of the situation. I mean, um, Nehru himself, it's a sort of odd, odd mixture of, um, uh, you know, third world socialism, technocracy, modernize or perish. Well, and you could say Corbusier himself, uh, his uh, ethos is also a kind of odd mixture of uh, different ideological strands. Did they overlap at some points? Pro probably they, uh, they, they did. Um, uh, you know, Temple of the New India uh, and, uh, and all of that. I, I think there's a little bit of a danger in, in using the, the, the term Nehruvian to apply to an aesthetic in architecture. You know, the, the architecture existed anyway, with, with or without, you know, with, with, it, it comes along, it so happens at the behest of, uh, of Nehru and his politics. But um, it, it, to kind of join the two terms too, too tightly together is a little bit at risk, I would say, Nehruvian modernism, especially since there are a whole lot of other modernisms operating in India at the same time. You know, there are, uh, 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 you know the kind of language which your father was involved in was, very prevalent in Chandigarh, but I mean, you know, there's a Joseph Allen Stein, there's a Doshi. Sure. There's, there, there, it's quite a complex, I would say, um, uh, eclectic uh, panorama, eclectic uh, archipelago, Indian architecture in the 50s and 60s. Right. Different, different strands of thought, you know, Kamvinde, uh, uh, different readings of Corbusier going this way, going that way. So I'm just a little bit cautious about it as a terminology. Right. Did you meet uh, uh, people like uh, Kanvinde and Stein uh, and this, uh, uh, other modernists of the time in Delhi? They were friends. We used to have tea together, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I was very uh, privileged because uh, I just headed off with these characters. I remember Kanvinde with his splendid hat, you know, his sort of Afghan yeah. hat. And um, of course, he was from a, a slightly different lineage via G GSD sort of gropious background, but not that that accounts for very much in the end. I think people over condition these discussions about people's schooling, but I, I admired some of his dairy buildings, you know, these buildings with these great industrial towers, you know, he had a particular ethos. Uh, Joseph Allen Stein, I, I also knew uh, pretty well, uh, who was the most philosophically minded uh, person quite extraordinary. I mean, again, see, he was actually basically an American socialist, if not a communist, who got out and and, and, and came, you know, I think in the MacArthur period. His, his background was very complicated, the way he eventually... Yeah, yeah. yeah, he got out during McCarthy, that's for sure, yeah. Yeah, and then he found his way in Bengal mm -hmm. and eventually back to uh, to Delhi. But his, his softened modernism of the International Center, for example, the way he placed that with the Lodi tombs, mm -hmm. uh, it was 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 very well done. It, it didn't, you know, it didn't carry me away in, in the way that you know some buildings can. But uh, I, I appreciated the, the slight organicism in his way of looking at the world too. You know, um, he 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 told uh, wonderful stories. I was with him having had tea actually in a grand setting, which was the American Embassy uh, uh, residence, and we stepped out into the long you know, alleyway of Chanakapuri there. And there was um, there were a couple of um, very poor ladies with sticks trying to beat down branches off the trees, and uh, and then here were, were all these uh, core diplomatic cars going by, ignoring them completely. Everybody was ignoring these ladies as they were trying to get this wood. <laughs> Stein said, "You know what Dostoevsky said about trees, William?" I said, "No." He said, "For the rich, their beauty; for the poor, their fuel." Mm, right. <laughs> and, and this would lead to a whole discussion about the the, the great un, unknown masses of India. You know, I was to totally aware uh, in, in all of these um, wanderings in India that I was, I was just in a tiny kind of sector of the reality of the place. I mean, uh, you know, I was in largely urban India, um, rather sophisticated, English speaking. Um, or as in Ahmedabad, which I love very much. But, you know, apart from our kind of deep, deep travels into, you know, a land of profonde, uh, um, you know, I was aware of this vast unknown continent, really, which was the rest of, uh, the rest of India. Um, but the travels were, uh, you know, they still, they're still with me. I mean, to, to say the, the way, 
the way we did things in that first, um, those first wanderings of 83, I mean, like taking um, the, the, the mail to, as far as Sholapur, the, the train that was on the way to Madras from, uh, from Bombay, uh, changing onto a single gauge railway, going to a place like Bijapur. Mm, you know, beautiful. Bijapur. Oh, of course, of course. Gorgeous yes. architecture. Wonderful. Absolutely. And, you know, losing yourself in this provincial town for a week when there were riots going on and God knows what was going on and living with a curfew. But um, at the same time, you know, you're sitting there and there's a power cut and uh, someone approaches your table and says, good evening, I'm the chief police of, uh, of Bijapur. And you think, oh God, he wants to see the papers or something. You don't have any used razor blades, do you? That's that's India, nineteen eighty-three. Wow. Yes. Now I, I was carrying, um, you know, a Pentax um, Spotmatic, hmm. about twelve reels of film. We were very disciplined. We had just whatever you could carry with you. That was, that was the rule of the game, um, and we were pretty fit in those days. In the way that I'm certainly not now. But anyway, and um, we we got eventually to Badami, which is another gorgeous place. And the, the guest house there had not been opened for about a month. So they panicked and opened up. And, and, um, uh, and then we, uh, you know, went off to, to photograph, the, to, to look at the caves and, you know, so forth. And then this is three weeks into the Indian trip. The winder jammed on my camera. Mm. Uh, Jesus Christ, you know, this is just a tragedy of the first order. Uh, we go back to the guest house and it was thronging with people. I said, what happened? He said, we don't know. A bus of Belgian people arrived and we're opening the whole place up. So I went around and there was a chap sitting there and I said, um, vous parlez français? Oui. Uh, um, uh, is there anybody in your um, group who knows about cameras? He said, ah oui, there's Monsieur Dubois who has the best camera shop in Brussels. So I gave it, he fixed my camera on the spot and the whole thing was done. But I mean, these, you know, the kind of losing yourself in villages, uh, sleeping in very, very primitive conditions, uh, you got a sense at least of, of, uh, of, of, of deepest rural uh, India. But at the same time, you know, the, the, the vast areas of, you know, 90 or more languages, the inner India, you, you didn't know, you couldn't know. No. No, that takes a lot, yeah. Yeah, that would take a lot. And now when you look back, India, you know, it's 2021. 1980 is, was like 40, over 40 years ago. Let me, let me put it in very kind of simple-minded terms. When, when I was in Delhi, the first, uh, first trip, I could walk down the center of uh, an avenue and there were just a few cattle munching grass, you know, between the embassies. Traffic jam that's, you know, bogged down for an hour, pollution with, with all the things you know. So, you know, obviously one of the things one would be talking about, which is important for, for, for architecture, is neoliberalism altogether. And, and uh, what, what kind of models um, were, socially speaking, important for architecture in the 80s in the state sector? And obviously uh, one of the uh, building types is the educational... Uh, citadel, if you want to call it that. I mean, to say uh, university buildings, educational buildings conceived as uh, uh, city, miniature cities like the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad to begin with, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, designed by Doshi or designed by Rajay or whatever. And those large kind of public uh, sector places were one of the areas of tremendous architectural and social invention. Now that's all gone. I mean, you know, it's a totally different world uh, that the architect operates uh, in, in, in India today. Um, and, um, you know, it's uh, c coming to India, um, the most recently, which was what, five years ago, it was a bit of a shock. I mean, to see the state, the state of smash and grab smash and grab uh, property developing. Uh, it's one of the reasons I blew the whistle on, you know, protecting the, the modern masterpieces. It's, look, it's one of the problems with IIM, you know, the, yeah. from this, um, you know, the Gujarati model of development, uh, so-called. I mean, if we get going on Mr. Modi, if you will. But um, I think that uh, 
there's that, and obviously there's the whole, you know, preoccupying erosion of secularism altogether, uh, uh, of the, the creation of a sort of re religious politics of, of, of a certain kind, uh, which is tr troubling to me at least. Uh, but that was well underway in the 90s. I, you know, I remember one of the bridges in um, Ahmedabad with orange flags all the way along it. And uh, I remember hearing from Doshi about the attack on the school, you know, by mm. extremists. So, you know, the, these are all, you know, this is another another India that's coming, has been coming about. But, uh, but I could go on and on about the, you know, the differences. A any thoughts you have yourself? No, I'm just, no, I agree with you. Uh, I mean, I... I feel very distant from the new India. Uh, I mean, I left, essentially left India in the mid eighties, somewhere there. Uh, and I feel uh, disconcerted when I go back to India now. And uh, thank you for this conversation. We will continue this uh, and focus more on, uh, in particular on Doshi uh, and his life and career in, 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 in our next edition. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.